What's going on everybody and welcome back to JDD TV. I'm your host Josh and we are back for another episode of our Canadian Men's National Team Abroad Series and this week's update is going to be from February 25th to March 2nd. We are recording right now Wednesday morning so any of the matches that are getting taking place on Wednesday I unfortunately will not be able to touch on but I got a very important question for you guys because I do this series because you guys seem to like it and you guys seem to enjoy it so I need some of your feedback right now. The MLS is back hence why I'm wearing the TFC kit right now. Do you guys want me to touch on the Canadian MLS sides? Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. Obviously, this is called Canadian National Team Abroad, so it's supposed to be touching on players that are abroad. But there's three teams that play in an abroad league, so I just want to see what you guys' thoughts are on it. And also being able to cover them throughout the summertime would allow this series to continue pretty much year-round, rather than probably taking a bit of a break waiting for the other leagues to start back up. So guys, very important question. Let me know down below. And with that being said, let's get into the update now. Be sure to drop a like, drop a sub, and let's get into it. All right, guys, so to kickstart this episode, we're going to head over to England like we usually do. And there's not a ton to talk about over in England. Just one player we're going to be focused on because a lot of them just simply did not play. That one player is going to be Junior Hoylet as he started as a left attacking mid in a 4-2-3-1 system, playing 79 minutes for Reading with an 86% pass completion, 45 touches, three shots as Reading lost to Blackpool 4-1 to to sit 21st place with a 10 5 and 19 record on 29 points with 6 points off of 22nd relegation place Barnsley. So not another good week for Hoylet as it seemed like Reading might have found a little bit of a rhythm there. They're definitely still in a dog fight and only 6 points off of Barnsley. A lot of ways to go if Junior Hoylet and company want to survive relegation. All right, guys, moving along now to Germany. We're going to the second division to take a look at Scott Kennedy, whose side Jan Rogensberg was once again looking to get back on track. Kennedy started and played 90 minutes as a center back in a 4-2-3-1. Kennedy had 50 touches, 11 recoveries, 3 interception, and played out of the back a lot, even though he struggled a little bit with his long balls as they drew 0-0 to Dusseldorf. This now puts them 10th in the table with a 9-5-10 record. Decent performance from Kennedy, got the clean sheet, but it just seems like this team has lost a little bit of its edge. They had such a good start to the season. It seems right now they're just going to be pretty content with a mid-table finish. Heading on over to France now, taking a look at our couple strikers that are playing over there. We're going to do a pit stop first with Lil and Jonathan David. As David started and played 90 minutes as a striker in a 4-4-2 system, David had 43 touches, a lot more than he's been usually getting. He had one shot and 81% pass completion. The service to him was a little lacking, but he was definitely more involved in this match as Lil won one to nothing over Lyon to put them at a record of 10, 9, and 7 on 36 points, 8th in the table. David still has not scored for Lille in two months, eight matches. But with that being said, this wasn't a huge win for Lille. They basically got the lead and then decided to defend the entirety of the, pretty much the second half, which obviously as a striker makes it a little bit frustrating. But David did what he could to get involved. And regardless of whether David scores or didn't, he played a contribution. Lille got three points and still puts them in a fighting position to go for potentially Europa League, maybe, maybe Champions League. Moving along now to the bottom of the table, well, relatively bottom of the table, we're going to take a look at Ike Ugbo and his side, Tua, who Ugbo was in action, started once again, started every single match so far for Tua since he got that move over from Belgium. He started and played 58 minutes as a striker in a 3-4-1-2 system as Tua drew to Marseille 1-1, massive result for them. Ugbo was solid throughout the match, he had 90% pass completion of only 18 touches and had an, and was pretty solid as well with his duels as Tua set 17th place with a 5, 7, and 14 record on 22 points, still tied with the bottom of the table Bordeaux. So that relegation dogfight is going to be absolutely insane for Toi and about four other teams down there. But getting a big result like this over Marseille is definitely a little bit of confidence considering they've been smacked around the last couple games. So hopefully EK can again take his time, find the back a little bit more and really help this push for Toi to survive relegation. All right, guys, moving over to the second division now in Netherlands, we're going to take a look at Brim, who's been one of my favorite players to touch on because he's been starting, he's been playing, he's had a really successful season so far, and Eindhoven are just on tremendous form, and it did not stop here as Brim once again started, played 84 minutes as a right wing in a 3-4-3 system. Eindhoven won 3-1 in the match, and Brim was lively throughout it. He even drew a penalty, which was converted, and Eindhoven now move up to fourth in the table with a 15 Five and seven record, winning six matches in a row. They are absolutely flying. Really, really hoping they can find a way to get to the top flight, get to the air divisi, because I think Brim playing at that level would do nothing but good things for him and his Canadian national team future. Heading on over to Belgium now, and my boy Tejan Buchanan, who I still need to get 
a Tejan Buchanan club rouge kit. But regardless, he did start once again. He played 90 minutes as a left wing back, really nailed down that position in a 3-5-2. He had a 76% pass completion. He had three shots. He had 87 touches on the ball, was unbelievably active throughout this match as club rouge won 4-1 to over Antwerp to sit second in the league with a 16-9-4 record. Tejan has been one of the players, guys, there's been a lot of Canadians who did end up getting moves in January, but his move seems to really have, have found a home. He's starting, he's playing well. 87 seven touches on the ball as a left wing back is not something to be shy away from. He's definitely involved with this this team. He's hopefully going to go for some type of silverware. He's got the league cup coming up for them as well. So another good week for Tejan Buchanan in Belgium. Moving along now, guys, to Greece, we're going to take a look at Derek Cornelius, another player who I absolutely love touching on because he got this kind of unknown move over to Greece, played for a mid-table team, didn't know if they were going to be fighting relegation, if they were going to maybe go a little bit up the table. We really didn't know, and Derek Cornelius has nailed down his position, really helped this team find a mid-table finish, and I don't think he did anything besides develop his game as he's consistently putting in tremendous performances. It did not stop here. He put in another good, good performance, going 90 minutes as a center back in a 4-2-3-1 system once again, getting the clean sheet as Panelikos drew nil-nil. They sit with an 8-5-12 and record, ninth in the table, and with all these performances throughout February, Cornelius is up for February's Player of the Month. Really cool achievement for a defense who's again playing for a mid-table team but he's contributed on the goals he's kept clean sheets he's been a rock at the back and I would absolutely love to see him pull off this award all right guys moving along to Portugal now we're going to take a look at Stefan Eustachio this is the story of the weekend I definitely want your guys' opinions down below of how you thought this transpired what your guys' thoughts are on the manager on the basically the the reaction of Stefan Eustachio which we'll get into because I have a lot of opinions I'm dying to get into it but let's get started at the very beginning. Stefan Stacchio has been playing a bit part role so far for FC Porto, and he was going to get his very first start for FC Porto against Gil Vicente. It looked like a good opportunity for him to kind of break into the team. This is a decent opposition for him to get a lot of touches on the ball and really put his stamp down. Now, three minutes into the match, Gil Vicente went down to 10 men. And with that, Eustachio was subbed off in the 31st minute. He started as a center mid in that 4-4-2. 31 minutes in, he comes off. Tactical decision. Stefan was clearly not happy with the substitution. And in the end, Porto drew nil-nil after being up for the entirety of the game. And with that draw, Porto sit in first place with a 24-0 record. Six points still above Sporting. But it raises a lot of questions, raises a lot of concerns. I am never someone, and this doesn't, this isn't even really biased, because I don't want to see this happen. Ever. I mean, it, it takes a takes some balls for a manager to try to do this, but FC Porto should be looking to win this match regardless. They would should win it with Stefan starting, without Stefan starting, whether they made it, whatever it is, this is an opportunity for them to win. Now they go down to 10 men, three minutes in. Let Steph finish out the half. He's already been playing as a bit part role, and this could go for any player, any player. But for me, it is humiliating for a first half substitution like that. And it's one you don't see that often. If he's making mistakes left, right, and center, potentially, if it's Porto going down to 10 men, you don't usually see it the other side around. I really, really was surprised when I saw this. You have a player who just got this move. He hasn't had an opportunity. This was his opportunity. And then you rip him off in the 31st minute. He's clearly frustrated. Now I know it's the manager's decision and I'm not a manager, but if I'm looking to keep the player relatively happy, wait till halftime. Wait till halftime. You could have brought him on at halftime and then not make it humiliating, ripping him off in the 31st minute. I don't think it's a smart decision. One, because he didn't win the game. Two, you just took a shot at a player who's just trying to come into the club. It really, really pissed me off. It did. And honestly, I've seen the situation a few other times, not in the exact type situation, but this is the wrong decision, in my opinion, from a manager to do no matter what. If you're not happy with the performance, you want to tactically change it for this, wait till halftime. Do not do it in the first half, humiliating the player, pissing the player off, and now obviously not getting the result you needed. Now, that's just me. Maybe I am coming a little bit from the Canadian men's national team perspective, but I really do believe that any player, unless they're having a disastrous, disastrous first half, should at least wait till halftime to get the player off and to substitute out for a tactical decision. Now, Jill Vincent can go ahead and make a substitution because they went down to 10 men. Take off a striker, bring on a center back, for example. This just, to me, seemed... Like, again, a lot of the Canadian men's team transfers so far. A little bit frustrating, but it'll be a good learning experience for Steph. Take it on the chin. Fight your way back into the, the team. You showed that you're frustrated, which is fine. Be, do it in a respectful manner, and let's see if he can find a way to get back in and hopefully get his full, full debut instead of having a little, again, bit part rolls. But I'm curious to see what you guys think. Let me down below. 
All right, guys, so very interesting topic coming up. It's Richie Ennen. He's obviously playing in Russia right now. I don't want to talk about the league. I don't want to talk about the teams, but I want to give praise to Ennen because he did have a pretty solid week. And I also want to see what you guys think in terms of athletes who are playing over in Russia right now with the disgusting things that are going on right there with them trying to take over Ukraine. It's It's been really hard for a lot of people to deal with. I might, my heart and soul goes out to all those fighting for this war. It's just unfortunate. I'm going to talk about Ennen's match a little bit, and then I want to see if you guys think that these athletes who are playing over there, if they're going to look for ways out of the country, they're going to look to cancel their contracts. I've been watching a lot on the KHL, which is the hockey league over there, and there's very interesting stories. So let's just get into Ennen, because he did have a successful week, and I want to praise that, but I won't be touching any real detail, as Ennen had a solid return from the winter break. He started, played 90 minutes as a striker in a 3-4-2-1 system. They won the match, and in the match, Richie drew the penalty, which was ended up tucking away to win the three points. Impressive performance for Ennen. He had 40 touches. He had an 89% pass completion, two key passes. He did solid with his duels as well. He had f- five fouls that he won really lively throughout the match. And there was another match that was I'm not going to touch on too much because Ennen did start playing at that striker role again but they were dumped out of the cup with a 3 nothing loss so my heart and soul again goes out to everyone who's having to deal with with this it's it's a terrible situation and very curious to see what Rich, Richie's dealing with right now but it was a pretty solid performance from him over, over this last week and a little bit of a disappointing cup performance but let me know what you guys thoughts are and if is Ennen gonna find a way to to leave Russia all right, guys, moving along to Scotland now. We had a couple Canadians going head-to-head. It was Ross County versus St. Johnstone. The first player we're going to focus on is Harry Patton, who started the match. He played 90 minutes as a cam in a 4-2-3-1 system. Ross County won the match 3-1 over St. Johnstone. Patton had 58 touches on the ball, 88% pass completion, 5 recoveries, and Ross County, with that win, moved up to 10th in the table with a 7-9-12 and record. On the flip side of things, Theo Bear didn't have... The most impact on the match is he was subbed on in the 72nd minute. He had a shot, 12 touches, struggled a little bit with his passing. He won three out of five duels. And with that loss for St. Johnstone, they now sit 11th in the table with a 5, 8, and 15 record on 23 points. So decent little head-to-head there for a couple Canadians, but Harry Patton and company with performance-wise and club-wise definitely got the better of Theo Bear. All right, guys, moving along to Serbia right now, we're going to take a look at a top of the table tilt. Between two of the best in Serbia, it was Red Star versus Partizan, and Red Star got the better of them. As Milan Borjan started that match, he obviously went all 90 minutes starting as the keeper, and Red Star, with that 2-0 victory, really made the title race interesting to the move up with a 23-1 record on 63 points, only two points back. They made a very interesting Serbia. It's going to go right down to the wire, and I'm hoping Borjan and company can find a way to tip the title and bring another silverware back to a Canadian men's national team legend. Moving along to Stefan Mitrovic, his side is not doing as well as Borjan's is towards the top of the table. They're actually in a big relegation fight right now as over the weekend, Steph started, he played all 90 minutes of the left mid in a 4-4-2 system. Raninsky drew 1-1 and with that result, they sit 11th in the table with a 6-11-7 record. They're only one point off a of 13th place and that is a relegation place right now. So they're definitely in that fight. The amount of draws and losses are starting to pile up and really sucking them down in. Steph's obviously got a lot of interest around Europe. Hopefully he can find a way to help this team survive relegation and get the move that he wants. But it's definitely into an interesting fight. We're going to have to see how Steph and company can do. Moving along to Switzerland right now, we're going to take a look at Liam Miller, whose side Basel had a good opportunity to try to claw their way back into the title race, taking on top of the table Zurich. But it wasn't meant to be. As Miller did start, he went 90 minutes as a left mid in a 4-1-4-1 system. Miller had 54 touches, two shots, and 82% pass completion. And he was very dangerous throughout the match, as Miller has been for the majority of the season. Unfortunately for Basel, they lost 4-2 to Zurich. And with that, it pretty much ended their chances at a title. They sit third in the table with a 10-10-3 record on 40 points. 13 points! now off of first play Zurich, who are probably going to cruise to a, a pretty impressive title for them, but... From Miller's side of view, it was still a successful game, even though it, it pretty much eliminated their title chances. Moving along to Turkey now, we're going to take a look at Besiktas, where Kyle Aaron did not feature, but Atiba Hutchinson did. He rolled the years back, as he so often does. Hutch started the match, he went 90 minutes, having 78 touches on the ball, a 95% pass completion record, 10 recoveries, 5 clearances, and just overall a really classy performance once again starting as that CDM in a 4-2-3-1 for Besiktas to help them hold on to a 3-2 lead to keep them 6 in the table with a 12-8-7 record. I don't know how this man can still do it. He just brings a calming presence to this team. He's able to go a the 90 minutes over and over again for this Besiktas team, but I think they've managed his minutes well, 
and he's in good form, which is good to see, and we'll hopefully see him once again add to his cap record for the Caymans national team in March. Moving along now to Samuel Adekubi, and when I use the word consistent, this is the player I like to put it on because he has really been a revelation in the Turkish league, and his performance just does not stop. As he started once again as a left back in a 4-2-3-1 system, he went all 90 minutes as Hataspor won 5-2. He played really solid. He had eight recoveries, five clearances, 60 touches for a left back. It's it's to me it's very impressive. 84% pass completion record as well as Hataspor now sit eighth in the table with a 13-3 and 11 record. They're still slipping away a little bit from Europe, but they are somewhat in the race. And we're gonna have to see if they're gonna battle with Atiba Hutchinson and the boys Bishik has to see who can maybe sneak into Europe. But again, the performance performances are there. The impact on this side is there with the amount of touches, the amount of movement he has. Big fan of Samuel Adekubi's development this year, and I'm excited to see him once again for Canada in the upcoming window because he's almost, almost locked down that starting left back position pretty much each and every time. All right, guys, we're moving on over to the United States, to the MLS. And as I said, we're not going to cover TFC, Vancouver, or Montreal, but I need your guys' opinions to see how you want me to cover the MLS going forward. But we're going to start with LAFC, a team that I was really looking forward to covering, seeing Bob Bradley move on, seeing a lot of their players move on, the, the amount of players they brought in, real turnover of personnel in that organization, and plus the uncertainty of their club legend, Carlos Vea. I was curious. I really want to know how they're going to do, plus bringing in Crepo Henry just got my interest even more. But let's start with Maxine Crepo who started his first match for LAFC, played obviously the All-90. He kept a clean sheet, convincing performance. He had a save in there as well as LAFC won 3-0 over the Colorado Rapids and very convincing style. LAFC with that win very early on, sits second in the West with a 1-0-0 record. Crepo looks really at home. A lot of really cool videos. Any of you Canadians, national team fans want to take a look at LAFC's Twitter, you're going to see an already passionate Maxine Crepo, which should just excite you guys. Also in that match, Daniel Henry did come on late in it. He was subbed on in the 86 minutes, basically just to help close things out. But on the flip side of things, taking a look at Mark Anthony K for the Rapids who have just I'm, I'm worried. That's that's the only thing I can say for Mark Anthony K because he was part of the LAFC team. He moved over to the Rapids for a awful play, playoff push. They've been dumped out of the CONCACAF Champions League and now their start to the season does not look good. But K did start, played 83 minutes as a cam in a 3-4-2-1 system. K had 89% pass completions, two key passes, 10 recoveries, 53 touches. But with that loss from the Rapids who got very outplayed. They sit in 13th place in the West with an 0-0-1 record. And the last player we'll be touching on today is going to be Raheem Edwards. He got his move from LAFC to LA Galaxy, and I thought this move would have been a good one for him, mainly because he found a way to establish himself last year under LAFC, and I wanted to see him find an opportunity to do that once again, and he did. He seems right at home once again. He must love California because he started and played all 90 minutes as a left back in a 4-4-2 system. Edwards had an 85% pass completion, 70 touches on the ball from, again, a left back position to me is just wild. Five recoveries, two successful dribbles, and he picked up an assist as well the, to the only goal of the game that helped LAFC beat NYCFC 1-0. And with that win, they sit third in the West with a 1-0-0 record. And getting a win over the defending champions like that is, is impressive to me. I think this is going to be a good move for him. I want to see him get back on the radar of Herman on that left back position, which is going to be very tricky, but we know he, how versatile he is. Wing back up even on a left mid, left wing, Edwards can probably play, but a very good week for him right there. But guys, with that being said, this brings us an end to this week's episode of our Canadian Men's National Team Abroad series. I really hope you guys did like it. Let me know about where you want me to take the MLS and let me know exactly what you guys think about Stefan Ustakio because to me, I'm sorry to rant, but it was just a very mismanaged opportunity to make a player feel at home. That was just my opinion, but we shall see. But all right, guys, on your way out, be sure to drop a like, drop a sub, and we'll see you guys next time. Cheers, friends.